interesting. Whatever, different strokes for different folks. How does DNA affect parts of our mood and our behavior? And what are some things that we can do to make it better? So one thing we did in our research, and this is what made our model unique, is we actually met the patient. So typically, genetic researchers look at genes in a petri dish and it's science that's separated from the clinical experience. We actually met 7,000 people. One by one by one, we interviewed, clinically reviewed them, supported them, helped them with their problems. And because of that, we were able to learn about people's behaviors and their moods and how they reacted and how happy they were and how sad they were. And the majority of what we call depression, anxiety, burnout, these things that we experience every day, we learn how those things are actually people's superpowers that are their greatest tool, but they're just in the wrong context. And so it's a burden on them. And I'll, I'll use myself as an example. So dopamine is the chemical that allows you to feel pleasure, right? So I eat some tasty pizza, listen to some music, I feel good, that's dopamine. It also allows you to feel reward, which means I did something good at work, I achieved something, I won, that's dopamine. Ultimately, both of those things are satisfaction. They're just two different sources of satisfaction. The way you experience dopamine is there's binders or receptors in your brain that have to connect it when it's released, and then there's an intensity level. There's a gene called DRD2 that determines how intense that experience is for somebody. Then there's a gene called MAO, which breaks the dopamine down, because eventually you need to get back to normal. So this is the thing that sort of breaks it down and metabolizes it. Then there's a gene called COMP that's like the broom that sweeps away that metabolite and gets you totally back to like default normal, right? So I have the lowest possible DRD2, so I feel things way down here. I have the fastest possible MAO and the fastest possible comp. So for me, pleasure is as low as it could be and it's gone that fast. So the outcome of that, I have three options. Depression, because the world sucks, I don't get to feel anything. My friends that are saying this is so good, I'm like, it's really not that great and I don't get what they're getting out of it. Addiction, because I do find that thing that gives me that pleasure hit and I go down that route. And that's why some people become so addicted to things because they can't get the pleasure and they need more and more and more and more. Or achievement, because I went down the reward route. Reward and dop uh, pleasure are both what dopamine powers, so I can pick a path. I've been all three, by the way. When I was younger, I was depressed because life sucked. I grew up in poverty. When I was a little bit older, I got addicted because a friend showed up to my house with something that he shouldn't have showed up with. And I little, used a little bit too much of it for a little too long, right? And now I'm in achievement mode because I had to take care of the family. My father passed away. I became responsible for my mom and my sister. And I started working and it was like a light switch was flipped and I became a different person. So what I'm saying is if you understand your mental map and the neurochemicals that drive any behavior, and we can talk about as many different mood and issues as you want, and you know what genes drive each step, you know who you are. You know exactly who you are, you know what you're designed for, and you know, here's the thing that's gonna make me feel great, here's the thing that's gonna make me feel horrible. I just need to shift over here, and the majority of these mood issues don't need to exist. Well said. And I feel like it even, of everything you're saying, I echo too, and it resonates. But now, I'll have a sidebar question, because I think the audience now would wanna hear is, we hear about dopamine hits. Yeah. And now with social media and we have all these different pillars and posts and people wanting to go viral, it's a form of dopamine hits. Is it the exact same thing that consumers, the audience members that are content creators are wanting to get into all this? Is it the same thing as it, like with our health, but translating it to a social media perspective? So let me tell you that there's a gentleman that runs the Stanford University Behavioral Change Lab. So he teaches, he has a course, professor, his name is Dr. BJ Fogg. He wrote the book, Tiny Habits, which is how do you actually change your behaviors and become a new version of yourself, right? His students built Instagram. So these guys that went to his course at Stanford University learned all about behavioral change and how to get actually someone to become a different version of themselves. They use that to build the Instagram algorithm because they understand how the brain works and they understand how to get someone constantly moving along and not 
the withdrawal is too much. And now when your brain gets, gets used to a certain dopamine environment, that's your new normal, right? So you've now elevated the game and I need that constant hit, constant hit. Let me check my likes. Let me check my comments, that constant hit, constant hit. And when you don't have it, that's depressing. Whereas five generations ago, you could have sat on a farm all day on the porch, just enjoying the sunshine. And that was your normal. So our brain will accommodate whatever environment you're putting it in. And if you put it into that high pace, high dopamine, up and down, delta values like this constantly changing, then there's going to be more anxiety. There's going to be more depression. There's going to be more mood issues. There's going to be more bad relationships because your brain is operating at a level that it was never designed for because of the environmental exposures you're creating through social media. And this is why so many people do so poorly. And um, so this can be personalized. Some people thrive, right? Some people don't. Understanding how your brain works genetically allows you to make those choices. Well said. Well said. And I want the audience to really just like grab a piece of paper, pen, paper, do whatever, you know what I mean? Rewind it back because there's a lot that's there and it's a lot to really understand because I feel like not too much like myself as, a, as somebody that's a consumer and a creator. I don't really look at the likes, like how many I get. It's more of yeah. like, am I doing my due diligence as a creator yeah. to respond back to the comments, right? Because that's what it comes down to. You want to engage and make sure that keeps going because you can build trusting relationships that way. You know what I mean? And things like that. But some people don't see it that way. They just think, I'll just like other people's comments and it is what it needs to be, you know? Yeah, you, your own reaction will tell you where you're at. If you're there meaningfully to support your community, it doesn't matter if it's one person you asking you a question or a thousand, you got the reward you needed because you did what your intention was. I want to help people. If you're there as a narcissist, <laughs> You know, and you're there for how how good do I look and feel and I need to create this environment to make myself feel better. You'll also know you're there for that reason because you won't get satisfied when only one comment comes and you have to deal with it. You need a thousand to feel good, right? So now you understand what that thing is doing to you. Is it is it useful and meaningful or is it more a problem and burden based on how you're reacting to it? Well said. You speak about hormones, right? Yeah. Men and hormones, and I feel like this is a deep dive because I really want to tackle both sides of the spectrum, men and women, right? Starting with women, right? Because I'm in the gym, right? We work out. You want to feel good, all that good stuff. Yeah. How does DNA affect women when it comes down to working out and things like that? And what are some things they need to be looking for? So we have an entire chapter just about hormones. And the reason why we did that is in our research, those 7,000 people that we studied to help to figure out how do we use genetics to figure out their main red flag and then find out what recommendations they need. The area where we saw the biggest problem that needed the most help was female hormone health. It is a truly, like it's a disaster right now. A woman trying to maintain her health as a woman, you know, in that estrogen estrogenic body, the response you're getting, it's your hormones. You're supposed to have a problem, right? It's just something you deal with. You're supposed to have crazy menstrual cycles and menopause and infertility and fibromyalgia. This is just part of being a woman. That's that's the actual answer these women get. What we learned genetically, and this is, again, why we dedicated a chapter to this, is that the genetics of hormones are very black and white. All this gray area of what is PMS, what is menopause, it's very black and white. How you make your hormones, to what level, just like dopamine, how much, right, can tell you a little bit more about yourself. What quality of hormones, some people make toxic hormones, which cause inflammation and make them feel bad and causes mood issues. How well do you detoxify your hormones? Because if you're making good stuff or bad stuff, the good stuff you want to use, the bad stuff you want to get rid of, how well does your body do that? That map, if you start to understand your own personal individual map, you can make decisions that are more personalized. For example... I want to look good. I'm going to the gym. Whatever that means to you, looking good. What is your goal and what are you genetically designed for? Are you even seeking the right goal? You know, you take, for example, Kim Kardashian and Kendall Jenner. They're sisters, right? One dad's different who gave them very different hormones. One's, one was an Olympic athlete. One was a lawyer. They look different, act different because they actually have very different hormones. Look at how those two sisters look. Kim, although there's some renovations that have been done to that body, you know, some fake parts, whatever, but even then, the underlying foundation is this curvaceous, estrogenic woman. Then Kendall is this slim runway model. 
That's hormones. Kim, Kim is driven by estrogen. She's estrogen dominant. That's what leads to those curvy female figures, beautiful hair, beautiful skin, right? Kendall is more androgenized. It's more testosterone dominant. Now that each one of those has their benefits and their problems. Kendall can see her six pack and her abs, right? She has no problem not having fat on her body. She can get really strong and lift weights and have nice lean muscle like an NBA player. She can look like that if she wants. Kim might have a challenge with that, but fertility is good. Skin is good. Hair is good. No acne problems. So they have very different sets of benefits and problems. Now imagine you're aiming for that goal or this person's aiming for that goal. The challenge and the depression and the anxiety and the struggle versus here's who you are hormonally. Now let's pick your goal and let's actually work on what you need to get there, not what everybody needs, what you need. You may need to take a supplement to block the conversion of estrogen, which is perfectly healthy, by the way. You may need to take a supplement to help you clear the toxicity, which could lead to breast cancer and ovarian cancer or mood issues or Alzheimer's. Let's work on that one thing. That's what your hormones are saying you need the most, right? So bottom line, this thing that women are dealing with, which is I don't understand myself because all the medical research is done on men, and not only men, Western European white males. So even for the two of us here, the research isn't relevant to us, right? The medical research is Western European white males, and then women and ethnic people are supposed to benefit from that when we're all different. So this is where we've done a lot of research there to help, you know, how do we take this gray area and make it black and white so women can thrive? Well said, well, well said, because I came from the health and fitness background myself, and you see a lot of women that extremely train and their hormones change. You speak about Jenner, Miss Jenner and stuff like that. And you see a lot of women are like, well, my boobs got sacrificed in the workout. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's just like, well, you got to think when you're ramping up your workouts, if you're doing strength training, you're doing cardiovascular exercises, your body's going to change a little bit. Yeah. Sometimes the estrogen is going down and your testosterone is going to go up. And then for some people, it's a little bit different. You know what I mean? And things like that. So it's like, I like that you speak about the supplements. It's nothing wrong because it's always been a thing, right? I was a retired trainer now. You always hear, I don't want to work out because if I lift weights, I'm going to be big. I'm going to be bulky. I'm going to yeah. look a certain way. I'm going to look manly. And it's like, no, you got to do some things for that to happen. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like, yeah. And for women particularly. So keep in mind that everything that we know about training started really from men train, men's training, right? The female training industry always existed, but it really exploded in the last few years with social media, with all these videos and pictures and influencers, right? So all of what we know and teach is around the man, the male body. Now think about this. Women have a monthly cycle. Right? They have a monthly menstrual cycle, so their hormones, their circadian rhythm of the female hormones is like this, up and down, up and down throughout the month. Men do the exact same thing, but we do it every day. Right, So we, we have a, we'll call it a menstrual cycle. We make progesterone, converts to testosterone, converts to estrogen, and you get rid of it. Men and women do the exact same thing, just at different volumes, but women take a month to do that exact same thing. Now, if you tell me, that a woman should go do the exact same thing as a man. That's why so many more women get injured. That's why they don't recover. That's why they have good days and bad days. The days they're sitting in their car in their parking lot and they don't want to get out of the car and go in the gym. Why? Because your hormones are completely different in different weeks of the month. Where for men, it's the exact same experience every day. If you go to the gym at the same time every day, you're going to feel the same way. Because that's the circadian rhythm of men. Women in their first week is when they should be doing all the heavy training. And we've learned this from the genetics. This is all in the book so people can learn more about it. That's the week where you do your heavy weightlifting. That's where you're adding muscle because that's when you have all your hormones. You're, you're making your hormones at that time. Testosterone, estrogen, it's all coming in, in a certain frequency, but it's all happening during that time. After that, you're gonna be much more estrogenized, which means your tendons and your ligaments are gonna be a little brittle which means more injury. We've worked with a lot of Olympic athletes, female Olympic athletes, and we kept showing the Olympic trainers that look at the week where the injuries happen. 
It's always that middle of the month where the estrogen and the estrogen toxicity increases, which leads to inflammation and tendons and ligaments getting sort of brittle and ready to be injured. And that's when something snaps, right? So you need to calm down and tone that weight down and just maintain. Then you get into this sort of yoga stretching type phase, right? Uh, and so for the women, it's like a monthly schedule as opposed to a daily or weekly schedule that men have. And then you thrive. Then you have your monthly gains, not your weekly gains, right? So just understanding that one thing can completely change a woman's outcome and how good she feels when she goes to the gym. Well said. Wow. There's a lot of, there's a lot that's there. I like this. So let's spin it off to men, right? Because I feel like you, you kind of unlocked it for women and now a little bit for men. How do men now balance their hormones and things like that? being in and out of the gym and stuff like that. Because like you hear a lot of guys will be like, Oh, I'm so sore. I'm like still sore after doing leg day or shoulder day and things like that. And I'm like, it's about how you feel your body also too. Oh yeah. If you're not eating the right things. What do you think is going to really happen to you? But yeah, I'll let you kind of speak on men and things. So like there's, that. I mean, in a nutshell, like you said, people think working out is enough. No, it's also fuel and, and sleep. Those are two huge things, right? Recovery is, is happening in your sleep, but for men, there's different concerns for women. The hormone concerns are breast cancer, ovarian cancer, you know, uh, hair, skin, um, all the big things that we complain about that we don't understand the root for men. The big things are libido, hair loss, right? Why am I going bald? Uh, prostate health. How do I know what's coming? Uh, and then of course, strength and agility and vitality at the gym. That's another huge one. So for, for men, there's some men that make a lot more testosterone. Some don't. Some actually make a lot more estrogen. In around 2019 or 20-ish, uh, so I'm in Toronto, and Toronto is the hub for NHL training. Off-season, all the NHL players come here. The best coaches in the world are here. They're all here training. So it was around 2019 or 20, I don't remember what season it was, where there was this phenomenon of all these hockey players who weren't recovering properly, who weren't doing well, were given hormones. So they're given what's called an androgen gel pack. So androgen is testosterone. You put this pack on your stomach and this gel gets absorbed through your skin. And the thinking is you don't have enough testosterone. I'm giving you testosterone. So that should help you, right? Some of the men started doing really well. A few weeks later, some of the men started complaining that they were a bit sore in their chest and their energy was down, their mood was off, their libido was off. So the answer is this guy needs more and they gave him more higher dose. That's when they came to us because now all of a sudden these guys had man boobs, gynomastia, right? They, they literally were changing who they were. So what happened? What happened was progesterone converts into testosterone. That's great. But there's a gene called CYP19A1 that takes your testosterone and determines how much of it it's going to convert into estrogen. And all men have this gene. It just depends what version. Some men have the ultra fast version. That means if I give you testosterone, you're turning it all into estrogen. And which is why some of those men grew man boobs, lost their libido completely, had mood issues. They had beautiful hair and skin. Their sh skin was glowing and the hair was better than it ever been, right? But what the purpose was, they didn't reach. Now, some of the other men, when you give them testosterone, there's a version of testosterone called DHT. It's like the manly man version that gives you the ripped muscles that you see on like basketball players or like, you know, UFC fighters. Um, but it also kills your hair follicles. It also enlarges your prostate. So if I give you, if you have the genetic path that takes your testosterone and converts it into DHT, there's a gene that does that. It's very clear. And I give you more testosterone, the net result isn't more testosterone. It's more DHT because you have the fast run of the gene converting it into that. So now I'm fueling prostate health issues. Now I'm fueling hair loss, right? I'm fueling these inf inflammatory problems from giving you this toxin. It's a toxic byproduct. So anything you're choosing, whatever these things you're working on, Instead of going through this trial and error, like, oh, I heard a podcast, maybe this is good, I watched a YouTube video, I'm going to try this. Yeah, maybe work for that person because they went through five, six, seven years of trial and error until they found the thing that worked for them so well and now they're screaming for their rooftops because they feel so amazing. It's going to work for two out of three out of ten people, 
right? The other seven or eight need to figure out what works for them. So all we're saying is you can fast track, shortcut, forget about the one size fits all trial and error. Your DNA is your human instruction manual. It's telling you exactly the way your body works. And then you just make the right choice on day one. Well said. Because I see, you see a lot of these videos now, people are like, how to increase your testosterone for men, right? Yeah. We want to do that because they wanted to get into the, you know, power lifting, strength conditioning, bodybuilding, crossfitting, whatever, right? Yeah. They all do it. It is what it is. But you have these, it was on TikTok I saw where somebody's like, oh, eat more onions. Yeah. And, like, and you see I, all uh, these people literally getting, peeling onions, eating onions whole like it's an apple. And I'm like, wait a minute, hold on. There's something wrong here. You know what I mean? And it's just how people are so easily influenced and things like that. What are three ways that we can naturally boost through DNA our testosterone levels so they're actually healthy? You know, so we're not going too crazy, going all out the out the out the woodwork and things like that. Yeah. So that onion thing, by the way, was an Andrew Tate phenomenon. He does that. So whenever he trains, he eats two raw onions every day. And that's why that thing went crazy because everyone wants to look like him, right? So, uh, well, not everyone, but a lot of people. So now (laughs) the answer is personalized. It's not here's what you should go do. It's here's what your body should go do. And it's not the same answer for everybody. So take me, for example, I make a lot of testosterone. I don't have a problem with, with testosterone. My problem is I convert it into DHT. So if I went and did something to go make more testosterone, I'm solving the wrong problem. I already make enough. What I need to do is block the conversion into DHT, right? And now just have more free-flowing testosterone. By the way, the single greatest marker for male longevity is testosterone. You want that number to be high, right? You don't want the estrogen to be high. You don't want the, you need some estrogen, but you don't want that estrogen toxicity. You don't want the DHT toxicity. You want this nice pool in the middle of testosterone. The guy that's hundred years old, you know, hiking up a mountain, he's got a lot of testosterone. That's why he's got that vitality, energy, youthfulness, recovery, all that stuff. So there's things like, you know, fenogreek that allow you to have more testosterone. The things like ashwagandha, um, there's some supplements you can find that have a combination of, you know, in fact, these two things that I just mentioned are usually in there, right? Uh, but you'll see blends. I can actually tell you the name of a product. One second. I'm actually going to open it up because I just told a friend of mine to go get this stuff. Um, it's called MRT. And it has, like I said, ashwagandha, Tonkat Ali. Tonkat Ali is a great thing to have you produce more. Um, there's something called horny goat weed, by the way. Which is amazing for testosterone. Heard about that. <laughs> yeah, you heard about that. Yeah, uh, and fenogreek again, uh, dim. So if your problem is that you convert it into estrogen, then you want to take dim, which is a aerobatase inhibitor. So if you feel like you're the guy that you can power lift, you're big, strong, you can deadlift 400 pounds, but you can't see the rips, you can't see the lines, that's estrogen. Most people confuse that. The big, strong guys that make them that big and strong, they're more estrogen dominant. You can't get mass and size without estrogen. Testosterone is more like the lean, thin guy, right? That's what testosterone looks like. Um, So if you are that big, heavy guy and you want to be more ripped and you want to see your six pack and you can't, then you might consider taking DIM. It's an aromatase inhibitor that blocks that one gene, CYP19A1, that converts your testosterone into estrogen. So you get really highly personalized. Imagine just you're going into your cells and like tweaking the way they work in a very healthy way, by the way. And then all of a sudden you get the exact result you want because your DNA is prescribing where the red flag is and what dial to turn. Well said. So basically you're saying like, without saying it, trip to the doctor to really just get aligned to figure out, you know, what your blood levels are like and things like that, correct? Yeah. So, I mean, blood levels, yes, because you're going to find out where your, where your hormones are at. Uh, the genetic testing that we offer will map this out for you and it will tell you exactly what your body is doing for hormones for diet, nutrition, should I be keto? Should I be vegan? The actual genes that metabolize those different types of foods. Uh, why can't I sleep properly? What are the genes that are disrupting my sleep? Everything about mood and behavior, depression, addiction, anxiety, procrastination, burnout, uh, you know, nar- people that are more neurotic, the different behaviors that prevent us from doing our best. Um, 
immunity, so the innate health of the cell. Why is it that when COVID came along, some people didn't even know they were sick, some people had a flu, and some people ended up in the hospital? Why do our cells do different things? And I'm going to touch on something there because you asked about recovery. Um, and then uh, everything about disease. So cardiovascular disease, diabetes, Alzheimer's. How do I know what's coming and what do I do today to prevent it? So the, the test that we put out there, it's called the DNA 360. That's what we talk about in the book through all those insights. So the book is kind of my story of how I use the DNA 360 to make myself a better version of myself. Um, and the actual measure of that, when I started this journey, I was 38. The company wasn't even formed yet. And I was really sick. Uh, I had depression, like I said, eczema, psoriasis, crazy migraines. I couldn't function, couldn't go to work, and gut issues, couldn't eat anything. My biological age, I tested it. So you can check internally what's going on and how old your body is on the inside. And I was 43. So I was 38 chronologically, 43, five years older biologically inside. I am now 43, actually chronologically, and my biological age is 33, right? So I've been able to reverse my age by, if you add the, the time that went by, it's like 15 years because of the work that I've done that I know is exactly what I need to do for my body. Um, so that's an example of what you can achieve. Now, what, the one thing you said about recovery, which we didn't touch on, so why do people recover at different rates? So when you put your body through physical stress and you get into what's called oxidative stress, you're putting a load on your mitochondria. So your mitochondria is that powerhouse of the cell that creates energy. So your body, all of your cells, there's 50 trillion of them that make up your body, take in oxygen and nutrition to create energy. And they're constantly doing that, right? So in that process of converting oxygen to energy, you create an oxidant. And oxidants are free radicals, they're toxic, they're inflammatory. We need to then understand genetically how efficiently do you clear from the cell this oxidant. So imagine you have this fireplace that's burning this fire, but there's no chimney. And the smoke is just piling up on the fire. Eventually, you're going to ruin that fireplace. And this is what's happening with some people's cells. They go around on the treadmill, they go do a high intensity training, they go run five kilometers, and they don't have the genetic capacity to clear all that oxidation that they just put into their cells. And they age themselves. So the thing that the thing that they think they're doing, I'm making myself healthy with this training, they're actually doing the opposite. They're aging themselves faster. They're leading to cardiovascular disease faster. They're leading to brain issues faster. Some people, this is the best thing they can do. The genetics point to that. It's very clear to understand what, what your brain does with it. So, or your body does with it. Um, so the second layer to that is now that some people efficiently maybe clear the oxidation of the cell, there's these traffic cops in the blood, this glutathione pathway, as we call it, that's looking for these toxins to send them to your liver to get rid of them. We know that the liver is your, you know, when you drink your glass of wine, your liver gets rid of the alcohol for you. It also gets rid of everything else, mold, chemicals, pesticides, whatever is coming in that's not supposed to be there. So if you also don't do that job well, which a lot of us don't, then those free radicals, those oxidants, that are inflammatory could be in your bloodstream causing inflammation everywhere. And now all of a sudden you wonder, why am I wrinkling so fast? Why did my hair turn white at this age so early? Right? Why do I, why when I do that cardiovascular training, my friend is up the next day and I can't get out of bed. I'm not recovered because the mitochondria, the actual cellular function is different. You're not able to do that kind of work. So we can highly, highly personalize Here's what your habit should be because here's what your DNA is instructing your cells to do. There's a lot that's there. Like a there's lot, so man. much there. And I just, and, and I love it because it's like, I know I've heard some of these terminologies and things like that. So it's like, as we're doing this podcast, it's like for the audience now to really just be like, there's a lot that's being said, but that book is going to be your, your golden ticket. You know what I mean? It's like, Willy Wonka and the chocolate factory, I like to say, you know what I mean? It's the golden ticket for you to really kickstart whatever's missing, plug and play, you know what I mean? And things like that. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's your personal instruction manual, you know, and start of, instead of making all these one size fits all type choices, 
It's like, here's exactly what I need to do to live to 110 and not be sick. And the energy level that I had when I was 25, I'm going to keep that until I'm 110. We Biology says that we should be able to live to 120. That's human capacity. Some people say it's more, but realistically what we know, 120. And at 120, you should still be walking and healthy. You should, you, you should, this is not in a hospital bed. The, the current average, the average American gets their first chronic disease by the age of 55. By the age of 65, they have two, and they spend the next 15 years in treatment. That's the American dream right now. Why? Because our food sucks, our environment sucks, our exercise sucks, our sleep sucks, the stressor sucks, the social media sucks. Like there's so many loads that we are not genetically designed for. Our bodies weren't built for coping with all this nonsense. And so it's really important to understand your personal red flag. Here's the jobs my body does really well. So I don't need to worry about that. My body's going to take care of that. But here's the jobs that my body doesn't do well. So I need to focus on that. I need to figure out environment, supplements, food, exercise. What do I actually do? given this is my genetic makeup, and then you can thrive, you can. So this is where, you know, we tried to detail in the book all of these different systems that we talked about earlier, and whether somebody has their genetics or not, great. Get your DNA test, you can do this for yourself. If you don't, the book details what I did for myself, and so it becomes easy, and you start to see things in a different way, and you start to understand that sleep is actually like this, and diet is actually like this and you start to cue into stuff that you probably wouldn't have so we tried to document the story in terms of how i went through this healing journey and why i'm now in the best shape best energy best mental spirit of my life because i've used my genetics to understand what my problems were uh, i think people minds will be blown and they'll learn so much about how they can change their lives oh, well said now for this book because we're in the same area we were talking and things like that um is there going to be a book launch that, that's going to be happening in the city, major city, or no? Oh, yeah. We're going to be launching in a few places. We're, so we are, we are big proponents of the biohacking movement, so the biohacking community. Uh, we love Dave Asprey, Ben Greenfield, all these guys that are into biohacking. And so we're going to actually be launching at the biohacking conference in Orlando, uh, which is in June. Our book comes out, um, you know, I think it's May 23rd. Uh, and so we're going to be there. And then from there, we're going to go everywhere. So we have, we're going to England, we're going all over Canada. You know, this is, I believe something that everybody has been waiting for. You know, it's like, tell me about my DNA. What is my body trying to say? And the, the proper science didn't exist because it was all disease centric. It was all, how does this gene equal the disease? But there's so much more to human biology than just disease or no disease. You know, why do we have to worry about disease instead of being in optimal health and not having disease? How, tell me that stuff, right? So this is where um, it's it's a message for everybody, and this is why we feel like from, from the, what we hear so far, everybody wants to know. It's going to be awesome. No, I love that. I love that. Where um, can everybody check you out on social media? Stay up to do. Stay, stay up to date. Stay up to date with all the information, any exciting things that are coming after the book launch and things like that? Sure. So three things you need to know. The book is at thednaway.com. So the DNA way, right? The testing is at the DNA company.com. So if you go to the DNA company.com, uh, you'll see the test. It's called the DNA 360. And by the way, for your audience, you know, I want to offer that we, create some kind of discount for them because you know if you're going to be getting the test we we want to honor you for spending your time here with us and learning together so we'll create a, a code and we'll put it into your notes here um and the third thing is you want to just keep learning uh we have our podcast and my social so the unpilled podcast unpilled where we speak weekly about different health problems and optimization issues and we're talking to athletes, celebrities, all sorts of people about their health journeys. And then my personal Instagram, CashCon, so K-A-S-H-K-H-A-N, official, CashCon official, constantly posting there about health news and what's going on and how to see yourself from a different lens. Uh, and that's the four things you should do. If you really want to change your life and you, and you get tested, it's going to be like the thing that you keep going back to. And unlike any other blood work, any other test, you only need to do it once. Your DNA doesn't change. 
right? And we keep updating the data. So every time you log back in, you're learning more, but you're not paying more. It's a constant lifelong education tool. So that's one thing that I think everybody needs to have in their health and wellness and performance toolkit is understanding their genetics um, to be able to make the right decision. So we'll get you the code. Uh, in fact, let's just, we can make it right now. It's the dnacompany.com forward slash Mitchell, right? So it's your your audience can get that discount and use that code. Don't go to the website and buy retail. The dnacompany.com forward slash Mitchell and you'll get a discount on the test. Oh, I love that. And I truly believe the audience is going to appreciate that also too. And Cash, if I appreciate you and uh, definitely got to get a copy of the book, you know, to support the creator. That's one of the things I always like to tell people. Support the creator also too and get the information that you need to learn. Right. Yeah. And then at the same time, um, I'll be waiting for the audio book also, too. You know what I mean? Okay, right. I just finished recording be... three days in the studio nonstop, fried my brain, but I'm ready to go again. <laughs> I love it, man. I love it. Well, I do appreciate you and um, definitely we'll do this again down the road. Pleasure, man. Good talking to you.